Well, this morning, I'm going to share with you from the book of Numbers. Now, several, I think, a couple of months ago, I started with this series on the book of Numbers, but after Easter, I stopped uh, because I felt led to keep sharing concerning the story of Jesus after His resurrection and the days before His ascension. So, this morning, I'm coming back to the book of Numbers, and uh, hopefully, you will follow, right? And I believe it's going to bless you. Now, you find that the book of Numbers is quite a complex book. It has not, it, it has not much order and no clear storyline. It contains a lot of names and numbers that do not make sense to us. So often, when we read the Old Testament, we will read Genesis, Exodus. Then when it comes to Leviticus, we skip it. But when we come to Numbers, we totally erase it. And we go straight to Joshua. So you find that Numbers is really interesting. Now, just by the title itself. You see, the Hebrew title of the book of Numbers is the word Bar Midbar, which means in the wilderness. It is taken from Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, where the, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. Everybody say, in the wilderness. So that is the word Bar Midbar. So it is, where, it is a book that recorded the journey of the children of Israel in the wilderness, where they came out of Egypt and they were making their way to the promised land. You see, their journey in the wilderness also describes our journey here on earth. You see, God saved us from Egypt from the slavery of sin. He broke the chains of shame and delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness into His kingdom of light. God's purpose is to bring us to an eternal rest, to save us completely, spirit, soul, and body. But while we reach, well, on the journey there, we are now here on this world, in this world, on this earth, and just like the children of Israel in the wilderness, we somewhat are like them in the wilderness. Why, why is this word called the wilderness? Because Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Everybody say, in the world you will have tribulation. That's right. Just like the children of Israel in the wilderness, they face trials, testing, tribulation. In the world, you will have tribulation. But Jesus said, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In other words, we too can overcome the wilderness of this life. We can successfully navigate through the wilderness of life. That is why in the book of Numbers, God left behind some crucial wisdom some wisdom that will help us navigate through life successfully. And if you can read the book of Numbers and pick up all this wisdom, you'll find that you can have, you can have the power to overcome the trials and the testing. And that is why I'm taking time to go through the book of Numbers. Now, the last time I talked about Numbers, I, I shared from Numbers chapter 1. Today, I want to move on to Numbers chapter 2. Now, Numbers chapter 2 began in verse 1 and verse 2. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The people of Israel shall come each by his own standard, with the banners of their fathers' houses. They shall come facing the tent of meeting on every side. Now, notice, Numbers chapter 2 began by talking about how the children of Israel were to come around the tent of meeting. That means the tabernacle, the presence of the Lord. And the Bible said that they are to camp facing the tent of meeting. They were to behold and look at the presence of the Lord. You see, the theme in Numbers chapter 2 is that the camp of Israel was to be arranged around the central presence of the Lord. What is the author of Numbers trying to tell us? Friends, here is an important truth. is that sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. 
And this is the universal principle of cause and effect. Whatever you sow, you will reap. The penalty, the result of sin is death. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, sometimes these consequences of sin not only affect our lives, they may even affect our children and our children's children. You see, it was not just affecting Reuben and Simeon. When we are reading Numbers chapter 2, it was 400 years after the incident. And 400 years later, in Numbers chapter 2, their tribes are still feeling the effects of their actions. Because sin has consequences. What is the author trying to warn us? The author is trying to warn us, don't ever take sin lightly. Don't ever take sin lightly. If you play with fire, you will be burnt. If you mess around with the bees, the bees will come and sting you. You see, very often, Satan wants us to think that we can sin without hurting anyone. But the camp of Israel shows that sin has serious and lasting consequences. And you've got to be careful. You've got to walk in the fear of the Lord. Are you with me? But yet, when you look at the book of Numbers chapter 2 carefully, it seems that the Bible is trying to tell us another thing. Because if our line of reasoning is this, that sin has consequences, then Judah himself would not be qualified to be on the east side. Why? Because Judah himself was not exactly blameless. In fact, let me tell you, Judah was quite messed up. Messed up. Okay, get ready for Korean movie now. <laughs> turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, get ready for Korean drama. <laughs> In Genesis 38, Genesis 38, you find that Judah was succumbed to the lust of the flesh. And what did Judah did? He visited a prostitute. In Genesis 38, look at verse 15. It says, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. Then she turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. Judah slept with his own daughter-in-law, Tamar. Korean drama <laughs> to the max. Messed up. How complicated can it get? Very complicated. Judah was someone who is succumbed, yielded to the last of his flesh. Then you look at Genesis, if you read Genesis 37, you will find Judah and his brothers, because of jealousy and bitterness and hatred, they plotted to kill their younger brother, Joseph. And they threw Joseph into a pit to let him die and eventually sold Joseph to Egypt. And Judah was part of the gang. So if you consider Judah, you find that Judah com committed adultery, hatred, and attempted murder. So shouldn't jo Judah be cursed and put on the south side or even the north side? But instead, Judah received his father's blessing. Look at Genesis 49 and verse 8. It says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. What a blessing. It seems that Judah had received grace from God. And it seems that his life has been transformed. Something happened to his life that turned the curse into a blessing. What happened to Judah? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> but before we answer the question, you've got to understand what is the Bible trying to tell us. Friends, yes, sin has consequences. The penalty of sin is death. But you know what? God's grace is greater. God's grace overcomes. His grace can change the end result of sinners. I like the Jubilee Bible. 
in Romans 6 verse 23, it says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the grace of God is eternal life. Where? Where is the grace of God? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Where can you find this transformation of grace? It is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you surrender your life, when you abide yourself in Christ, the divine grace of God comes and you experience a transformation where all things pass away and all things become new. And you know what? The Levites, because of their radical commitment to protect God's holiness at Mount Sinai, they earned the privilege and the responsibility of camping closest, closest to the tabernacle. The Levites may not have a north, south, east and west that they can call their own. They were still scattered like what their father, father, father Jacob Israel said. But although they were scattered, they brought the law of Moses to all the towns, communities of God, wherever they go. Their scattering was no longer a curse, but a blessing. Romans 8 verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yes, there is a law that's working sometimes, tearing us apart, the law of sin and death, where there is consequences. But if you were to choose Christ, abide in Christ, surrender to Christ, a new law kicks in called the law of the Spirit of life. A law that says curse can be transformed into blessing. Weakness can be transformed into your strength. That's why I like what Watchman Nee said. He said this, A spiritual person is not just born again, but born again and walking in spiritual alignment. You align yourself with Christ. You cross over to the other side. You choose the Lord's side. In conclusion, sin has consequences, but God's grace is greater and more powerful. God can transform every curse into a blessing, every liability into an asset, like Judah. You may struggle with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Or maybe like Levi, you struggle with your emotion, you struggle with anger, with wrath. But this morning, I'm here to tell you that God's grace is able to bring transformation. Everyone has their weaknesses and challenges, but He can use our weakness and make it a strength. And in conclusion, let me give you the final verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I like what Paul says in verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It is not by might. It's not by own strength, cleverness. We all have our fair share of weakness and challenges, but all God wants is every single day like Apostle Paul will come to our knees and say, God, today I choose you again. Today I choose to stand up and cross over to the other side, to your side again. No matter how many times I'm knocked down, no matter how many times the world pull me away, I will choose you. Daily, you choose to take up your cross and follow Jesus. And that is where the grace of God becomes sufficient for us. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap, shall we? We may have the musician come. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Are you all blessed? Shall we all stand to our feet? Hallelujah. God is with us. Amen. This morning, as we close, why not let's remain where we are. Let's not move out of the service. Usually, like what Dr. Dale, uh, Bishop Dale Bronner said, 
the most important meeting is not the meeting itself. It's a meeting after the meeting and the meeting before the meeting. The most important part of the meeting is right here, right now. When you make a decision, when you make a decision for Jesus Christ, when you make a decision to cross over to the other side, the transformation comes very often. It's during the worst moments of your life. Some of us here this morning, it could be the worst moment of your temptation struggles. For years you have been a Christian. It seems that every, every year it's all right, but suddenly something came up. Like Judah, like Reuben, like Levi. Sometimes we react and we responded, we make wrong decisions. But this morning can be the moment of transformation. Moment when you come before Christ and say, Jesus, I choose you. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I give you my eyes, I give you my hands, I give you my feet, I give you my all. If you can use anyone, use me, Lord. And if that's your decision, that's where the grace of God comes. Transformation happens.